Hello and welcome to this revision session on periodic motion, which is part of the AQA A-Level Physics specification. Now in this particular revision session we're going to look at reviewing the concepts of periodic motion via answering questions. So how to prepare for this revision session? Well, when you're completing work in this revision session, divide your piece of paper into two sections. Make the section on the left hand side larger than the right hand side. In this left hand section, write down your working out and answers to the questions in the revision session. When doing this, make sure you write out in full sentences and show the working out. Whilst in the right hand side, write down any piece of information which you find useful or any hints and tips on answering questions from this revision session. And at the end of this revision session, write up these notes into a revision sheet for you to use independently. Now how should you be revising for your AQA A-level physics examinations? Well the first thing is to learn the key facts. Use your revision guides, use your class workbooks, use your student prep notes, use your textbook to learn the key ideas of the course. Course. Now you may wish to make mind maps or to write out notes yourself to gain this knowledge. Then step two, test yourself. Use the Caboodle e-learning platform. Use the Seneca e-learning platform. Use student knowledge checkers to quickly test your own knowledge. And you may wish to do this from your own cue cards by carrying out this retrieval process. Then finally, step three, use examination preparation books, homework books, supervised study books, additional workbooks to answer examination questions and mark your own work. And you may may wish to download your own examination past papers to do this practice idea. So the concept of learning the key facts, then testing yourself, and then practice examination questions are the easiest way and most effective way to carry out revision for AQA A-level physics. So let's start off by answering some questions on periodic motion. So let's look at the following question. The United States Space Agency, NASA, uses a centrifuge to test whether equipment will operate when experienced large forces. The equipment will be tested by attaching it to the end of the frame of a centrifuge which rotates around a vertical axis at its centre. The centrifuge rotated 50 revolutions per minute with a radius of 8.8 .8 metres, so that the angular velocity of the centrifuge is about 5 radians per second. Then explain how the centrifuge applies large forces to the equipment under test. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so the first thing you've got to know is you've got to look at this idea of proven angular velocity. Now we know angular velocity is equal to 2 pi over t because it's going to be the change in angle over the change in time. So in one time period it changes by 2 pi radians. So the first thing you know is that it does 50 revolutions per minute so therefore it's going to do 50 times by 2 pi radians in a minute because one revolution is 2 pi radians. You then divide it by 60 seconds because you want it for one second, so you get your answer to be 5.2 radians. Now explain how the centrifuge applies large forces to the equipment under test. Well, how do you work out the force when it's moving in a circle? Well, it's going to be uh, the centripetal force. Now, you've got a variety of equations which you can use to work out the centripetal force, but you've, got, you've been given the angular velocity and the radius. So the most common one to use would be F is equal to m omega squared r, it's the idea is that r is very big because 8.8 .8 meters is a large radius so therefore you are going to have a large value of force or you or you could also say there'll be a large linear velocity as well because it's spinning at a, at a fast rate Let's look at the next question. Within certain limits, the bob of a simple pendulum of length L may be considered to move with simple harmonic motion at period T where T equals 2 pi over square root L over G and state one limitation that applies to the pendulum when this equation is used. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, it's very important you know your assumptions for your simple pendulum. So you could have the following ideas, that the string is inextendable, so it's not stretching, that the bob is a point mass, so you only have, you know, consider the mass of the object, but the most common one for a simple pendulum is that the amplitude of the oscillation is small. It's 10 degrees or less because you're using the small angle approximation. Let's have a look at the next question. Describe an experiment to determine the value of the Earth's gravitational field strength g using a simple pendulum and of and any other appropriate apparatus. You should in your answer describe how you would arrange the apparatus, indicate how you would make the measurements, explain how to calculate g by a graphical method, then state the experimental procedure you would use to ensure that your result was accurate. So pause the video now 
then unpause the video when you're going through your answer. Right, so the, the best thing to do is to make sure you answer every single point, bullet point given in the question. So you would do that in a logical order. Now it's interesting to note that a low answer is information is poorly organised and may not be very relevant or coherent. So again, how do you show that organisation? Just answer every single bullet point in order. Now again, for a high level answer, you're clearly organised, which is excellent. You then got a coherent and then logical um, manner, which is again very appropriate, and then you answer make sure you answer the question correctly so what could be included in this so firstly you want a diagram which shows the bob suspended from a fixed point on which the length l can be labeled again length l is measured from the fixed point of the pendulum to the center of mass of the bob remember what our l is always the time period will be measured by a stopwatch time and a number of oscillations you then do a measurement of time t for the same l and do repeats of that you would then do five different values of of l and get your different values of t then you do t squared against l and the graph is a straight line through the origin where the gradient is 4 pi squared over g now what could you do to ensure good experimental technique so you always talk about what can you do to get an accurate experimental value and for the pendulum there are a few of them you do um, you do small amplitude oscillations because otherwise the small angle approximation wouldn't work you'd measure l from the point the fixed point to the center of mass of the bob you would measure a large number of oscillations and then divide by that number of oscillations to lower your percentage uncertainty you do number of repeats you can count the oscillations at naught when t equals zero so there's no zero error you would only measure complete oscillations because you can't really estimate half oscillations or three quarters oscillations you would use a fiducial marker which is placed at the center because that's where the smoothest transition is to help you measure an oscillation you would only have your pendulum swinging in one plane and then finally you would avoid value you would avoid very small values of L because you won't get very accurate results because the percentage uncertainty will be too high next question when carrying out the experiment in, pr in the previous part B, a student measures the time period incorrectly. Mistakenly, the student thinks that the time period is the time taken for half an oscillation instead of a full oscillation. To juice the effect this would have on the value of G obtained from the experiment, explain how you would arrive at your answer. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answers. Right, so you've got to be able to manipulate the equations and work through what would happen. So you would say that, well, we're going to be doing a graph of t squared is equal to 4 pi squared L over G. So straight away, pi squared, it's, it's going to be irrelevant. So what we're going to say as well is, uh, is when we do t squared against L, okay, we've got this idea that L is going to be irrelevant because L isn't changing in the equation. So what do you know? You know, t squared is going to be like approximately, it's going to be proportional to 4, uh, well, 4 over g. So as a result, this is telling us that if we are doing half a value, because it's going to be by the factor of 4, so the measured value of g will be 4 times that the true value of g. Again, because therefore t squared is a quarter of the true value. Right, next question. The diagram represents a toy aeroplane on the end of a string. The toy aeroplane follows a horizontal path of radius r and the string is at an angle theta to the vertical. Complete a free body diagram for the toy aeroplane, ignore any forces due to the air. Then the toy aeroplane completes 36 revolutions in one minute, calculate the speed of the aeroplane, where r is equal to 40 centimeters. So pause the video now, then unpause the video and you want to go through your answer. Right, it's very, very important that you can draw a free body diagrams. Now you'll notice that you're going to have to draw a couple of things. Firstly, you've got to have weight. Now weight always acts vertically down. It acts towards the center of the earth. So you draw the weight vertically down. Now the tension is due to the string. So therefore it has to act at the same angle of the string because it's the pull and force on the string. So therefore the tension acts upwards like that. Now in our next question, we need to work out V. Now, if you notice in the question, you were given the value of R, which is going to be 0.4 meters, and you can work out what the value of omega is. Now, again, you've got to remember that omega is equal to the change in angle over the change in time. Now, we know that, that there is going to be 2 pi times by 36, because there's 36 revolutions there. So you do 36 times by 2 pi over 60 seconds, because once again, you don't want to work in minutes, you want to work in seconds, and you get an answer of 1.51 meters per second. Now again, does that sound logical for a toy aeroplane on a string? 
Yes, it does. So it's most likely to be correct. Next question. By considering the vertical and horizontal components of tension so that the angle theta is independent of the mass of the toy aeroplane, then suggest how a value for theta can be determined experimentally. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so it's very important how you work this one through. Now, if you're trying to show that the angle is related to something, then you're gonna have to you're gonna have to split up your tension in this case into the horizontal and vertical components. Now, you know you've got to do this even even without it being stated in the question because tensions act at an angle. So therefore, it's not fully in the horizontal and it's not fully in the vertical. So therefore, you've got to be able to split it into those two components. So you would look across and you'd say, well, the horizontal component by drawing your diagram is gonna be T cos theta. So we draw our right angle triangle and we'll work out that our horizontal, it's gonna be telling us that the horizontal component is equal to T cos theta, sorry, T sine theta, my apologies. My apologies for that. So T sine theta. So therefore we'd say T sine theta is equal to MB squared over R. We can also look at the vertical component. In this case, it's going to be T cos theta is going to be equal to the only force in the vertical, MG. So we know that T cos theta equals MG and T sine theta equals MV squared over R because MV squared over R is the centripetal force. Now, we've got our values of t cos theta equals mg and t sine theta equals mv squared over r but we need to get m out of the equation because if it is truly if if that angle is independent of the mass well therefore mass won't be in the equation so there's a trick you can do and that's dividing the uh, t sine theta equation by the t cos theta equation now you should know sine theta divided by cos theta is equal to tan theta so t sine theta over t cos theta the t's cancel through so you get that equal to tan theta Theta. The two m's will cancel through because it, be, it would be mb squared over r divided by mg. So that leaves us with v squared over rg. So that proves to us that theta is, an, is independent of m because m is not in the equation. Now, how can you then determine theta experimentally? So again, once again, you've got to think about your experimental technique and what can you do to reduce your percentage uncertainty. So you could have a video and play it back and then look at ways to measure the angle from the video, or you can measure the diameter of the rotation and the length of the string and then use trigonometry to calculate the angle. You could measure the diameter of the rotation and the height of suspension again use the trigonometry to work out your angle or you could um, measure the rotational period and the radius of the rotation and then use an equation to then work out the angle or you could uh, measure the speed and the radius and calculate the angle you could once again use an equation. So think about what you could be doing. Next question. A plane is flying at a constant velocity as shown. The plane banks, the, pl the pilot banks the plane and the lift force L is now inclined at angle theta to the vertical. Explain why this results in circular motion. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so what you've got to do is you've got to think to yourself, what causes circular motion? Well, there will be a resultant force towards the center of the circle. Now, because L is at an angle, you will get a vertical component of L and you'll get a horizontal component of L. So what you'll see is that in the vertical, that that vertical component of L will equal weight, whilst the horizontal component of L is unopposed, so therefore that will be acting as your centripetal force. Now again, the other definition of centripetal force is that it acts perpendicular to motion. So that horizontal component of L is acting perpendicular to motion, acting as the centripetal force. The next question, the plane continues to fly with the speed v. The angle theta is given by tan theta is equal to v squared over r. Show that this equation is correct, then calculate the radius of the circular path, where v is equal to 150 meters per second and theta is equal to 10 seconds. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. So let's have a look. And it's the same idea as before. Again, the hint is if you are asked to prove or show that something is equal to tan theta, you're going to have to work out the horizontal components. You have to work out the vertical components, equate them and then divide one by the other to get your answer out. So we should know that in the vertical L cos theta, now you can work out that the vertical component is L cos theta by drawing your right angle triangle on the previous diagram. So L cos theta is equal to weight or mg while l sine theta the horizontal component of l is equal to mv squared over r you would then divide one by the other so you would then say well mv squared over r 
divided by mg is equal to l sine theta over l cos theta. The l's cancel through and you get tan theta. The m's cancel through on the other side, so you get v squared over rg. And there is your proof. The next one is you would rearrange that equation. So you therefore say that r is equal to v squared over tan theta. Then you've got all the information from the previous question. You can then pop them in and you can work out your answer. The only trick being that radius has to be in meters. It has to be in meters for this to work. So you would work it through, so therefore r is equal to 13,000 meters because you're doing 150 meters per second squared divided by g, which is 9.81 times by tan theta, so that has to give you a radius in meters. Next question. The International Space Station completes 16 orbits of the Earth every 24 hours. The ISS is 330 kilometers above the surface of the Earth, so that the angular velocity of the ISS around the Earth is about 1 times 10 to the minus 3 radians per second. Then calculate the acceleration of the ISS in this orbit, where the radius is 6,400 kilometers. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. So, how do you answer this question? Well, the first thing to note is you've got to remember that angular velocity is the change in angle divided by the time taken. Now, we know that in one, in one revolution, the change in angle is 2 pi radians, so you do 2 pi over t, so therefore you do 2 pi times by 16, because we know that there's 16 complete orbits, then we divide that then by the time it takes to do that in seconds. So it's 24 times by 60 times by 60, because we need to convert hours into seconds, so we get 1.16 times 10 to the minus 3 radians. We can then say that acceleration is equal to r omega squared. Now there are multiple equations for the centripetal acceleration, including a equals v squared over r. But you've been given omega, or calculated omega in the previous question, and you've been given r. So you would use the equation a is equal to r omega squared. The next trick is then to ensure that you're using the correct value of r. Now the first thing is it's got to be in meters and not kilometers, so you wouldn't have it as in 330 in your value anyway. But the second thing is the value of r should be from the center of the actual rotation which isn't the center of the is wasn't the surface of the earth rather it's the center of the earth so you've got to do 330 kilometers plus 6400 kilometers which is the radius of the earth times by 10 to the 3 to convert your kilometers into meters then you multiply it then by your value of r to get 9.7 meters per second squared let's have a look at the next question the photograph shows part of the cycling track used in the london 2012 olympic games on the bend that the track is banked so that the outside of the track is higher than the inside. The diagram shows the forces R and W act on the cyclist traveling at a constant speed around the bend. Explain why there must be a resultant force act on the cyclist and explain why the bank track is at an advantage to the cyclists. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answers. Right, so in our first question, we need to know what causes a resultant force. Well, the one thing that causes a resultant force is acceleration, so there must be an acceleration on the object. Now we know this because the direction of the cyclist is continually changing as they go around in a circle, so their velocity is changing. Now why is the banked track an advantage to the cyclists? Well, what is causing Okay, the rotation, well, or the set, or the centripetal force. Well, it's going to be the horizontal component of the reaction force, as that's the resultant force in the horizontal towards the center of the circle. So the horizontal component of the R will contribute to that centripetal force, so therefore the cyclist can go faster. Next question. A simple pendulum is given a small displacement from its equilibrium position and performs simple harmonic motion. Then calculate the frequency of the oscillations of a simple pendulum at length 984 millimeters and give your answer to the appropriate number of significant figures. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so the first thing you've got to do is you've got to be able to define simple harmonic motion. So simple harmonic motion is that acceleration is proportional to the displacement from equilibrium, but the acceleration is in the opposite direction to the displacement. Now you could you could interchange the word force for acceleration here, but you've always got to state that definition for simple harmonic motion. Now for the next one, what you've got to do is you should work out the time period of your simple of your simple pendulum. So you say t 
is equal to 2 pi times by the square root of L over G. Now again, it's important we convert our length from millimeters into meters. So it's 2 pi times by the square root of 0.984, which is millimeters into meters, divided by 9.81, which gets us 1.90 seconds. Then what you would do is then you would go, frequency is 1 over time period, so it's 1 over 1.990, so it's 0.503 hertz. Now you give your answer to three significant figures as the only value given in the question, the length is given to three significant figures as well. Next question, calculate the acceleration of the bob of the simple pendulum when the displacement from equilibrium position is 42 millimetres. Then the simple pendulum of time period 1.90 seconds is set up alongside the pendulum of time period 2 seconds. The pendulums are displaced in the same direction and released at the same time. Calculate the time interval until they next move in phase. Explain how you arrive at your answer. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer. Right, so the first question is you've got to work out the acceleration. Now, what people do is a lot of people just forget that a pendulum is carrying out simple harmonic motion. So you can use your general simple harmonic motion equations to work out the answer. So we'd say that acceleration is equal to minus omega squared x. Now, in this case, we've not actually got x. So we've not got uh, omega, but we've actually got f. So we can say that omega is equal to 2 pi f. So we can say acceleration is equal to minus 2 pi f squared times by x. So it's minus 2 pi times by 0 0.5025 squared times by 42 times 10 to the minus 3. Remember, we don't work in, in millimetres, we work in metres. So our answer is 0.42 metres per second squared, which looks about sensible. Now in this next one, what you've got to do is as follows. So to work out when things will arrive in phase, you've got to understand that the difference between the two of them. So what you would do is you would say that um, that if you can work out the difference of one of one oscillation or has a phase change of two pi radians. So we can say that there's a difference in the time period of 0 0.1 because there's 1.90 for one of them and 2.0 for the other. So we say that the difference in time periods between the oscillations is 0 0.2. 0 0.1 now we therefore need to work out how many we would need to how many we need to do to then get up to 2 pi radians so we would say that n is equal to 2 which is from the 2 pi radians divided by this difference in time 0 0.1 so therefore we would need 20 to get there so that that tells us that basically we would need to have 20 oscillations before we would actually get to the um the, the, to be in the same phase with each other now it's important to note that this is from the perspective of the sh of the pendulum that goes slightly that has a shorter time period so therefore the time into the next phase will be 20 times by um, 1.90, which gives us 38, 38 uh, seconds for it to work through. I mean, the other way you could possibly do it is say n plus one times by 1.90, which is the time period for the um, shorter one is equal to n times by 2.0, which you can then work through, get n to be the subject of n equals 19, then work it through to be 38 seconds. Next question. Name the two types of potential energy that involved in the mass spring system when it's performing vertical simple harmonic motion. Then describe the energy changes which take place during one complete oscillation of a vertical mass spring system start when the mass is at its lowest point. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through the answers. Well, the first question is just rote learning. It's just facts you've got to know. And you think about what is the potential energy stores in a mass spring system. Well, we've got the elastic potential energy of the spring, and we've also got the gravitational potential energy due to its position in the gravitational field. Now then describe the energy change which take place during one complete oscillation. So what you would know is it starts off with elastic potential, it would then move to kinetic energy, it would then move to gravitational potential energy. Because you would know that when it's at the start, it's fully stretched, Therefore, when you release it, it will then have its highest kinetic energy store in the equilibrium when it's moving the fastest. Then when it's fully compressed, it has its highest point. So therefore, it have most gra gravitational potential energy. And then we go back down in our system again. So when it goes back down again from most compression, it then goes to equilibrium and it has then got its maximum kinetic energy. And then back when it's fully stretched out, it'll have its maximum elastic potential energy. Obviously, we can go the other way around and start when it's fully compressed. So we go potential energy, then kinetic, then um, elastic potential, then kinetic, then gravitational potential again. 
Next question. Figure 3 shows the, how the total potential energy due to the simple harmonic motion varies with time when a mass spring system oscillates vertically. State, that, state the time period of the simple harmonic oscillations that produces the energy time graph shown in Figure 3, explaining how you arrive at your answer. So pause the video now, then unpause the video when you want to go through your answers. Right, so what you've got to do sometimes in questions is you've got to extrapolate information from the graph. Now you can consider a mass spring system just as another form of a wave. So you can look on your wave and work out how long it takes to carry one time period, which is from same point on one wave to the same point on the next wave. So the most obvious one would go from peak to peak. So the peak starts at zero in the graph, it goes to 0.4. So therefore that tells us that from peak to peak there, it's going to be 0.4, but then we're going to multiply it by two to get to 0.8 because obviously we've gone back to that same position again. So therefore, during one oscillation, there are two energy transfer cycles. So because if you think about it, you'll be going from when you're going from kinetic to kinetic, for example, you will be going from midpoint to midpoint. So, and there are actually two times you hit the midpoint in your um, cycle. So you've got to be very careful on that. Because for example, during one oscillation, you go from elastic potential to kinetic to gravitational potential, back to kinetic, back to elastic in one cycle. So you'd have to multiply your answer by two. Let's have a look at the next question. So sketch a graph on figure 4 to show how the acceleration of the mass varies with time over a period of 1.2 seconds, starting with the mass at the highest point of its oscillation. On your graph, upwards acceleration should be positive and downwards as a negative. Now the mass of the object suspended from the spring by in part B is 0.35 kilograms. Calculate the spring constant using the figure 3, stating a unit for your answer, and the maximum kinetic energy of an oscillating object is 2 times 10 to the minus 2 joules show the amplitude of the oscillation is about 40 millimeters so pause the video now then unpause the video when you want to go through your answer right so how would you do this one so what you've got to note is it will be a sinusoidal curve because acceleration uh, links in as a sine graph okay as a result there uh, as a sinusoidal curve there of 0.8 working through but then also as well you're gonna have to have as a, co as a cos graph because it's the opposite of the um, displacement graph which is a cos so it's in the other direction so it works it through. So it's actually going to be a cosine pattern uh, so it would start off with t equals 0 then run to 1.2 working it through like that. Now the next one is asking you to work out the spring constant. Now the only equation you know for a mass spring system with the spring constant in for, for this one is going to be 2 pi is equal to so t is equal to 2 pi times by the square root of m over k. So you'd rearrange this equation, make k the subject, pop in the values, and then work it through. So you know that from the previous question, t was 0 0.80. So you can work out what k is by doing 4 pi squared times by 0 0.35, the mass in kilograms, divided by 0 0.80 squared equals 22, or 21.6 newtons per kilogram. Once again, that sounds about sensible as well. Now, how can you work out the amplitude of oscillations? Well, we know that the maximum kinetic energy from the question is equal to 2 times 10 to the minus 2 joules. We can then rearrange this and make and work out what v is going to be so we know v squared is going to be equal okay to 2 times by ke over m so we know that it's going to work through as such to get our maximum velocity to be 0.338 meters per second we then know it's still carrying a simple harmonic motion so we can use the equation v is equal to omega a so therefore a is equal to v over omega now omega is 2 pi f so we know it's 2 pi times by 1.25 which is its frequency so therefore a is equal to 4.3 times 10 to the minus 2 meters. It's always very important to remember that when you're looking at mass spring systems and simple pendulums that you always can use the simple harmonic motion equations. So with that brings us to the end of our revision session on periodic motion. Thank you very much for watching this particular video and have a lovely day.